cases. Everybody had a very good. Yeah, wow. Not in my case. <laughs> but yeah, life is uh, full of ups and downs, isn't it? So, thank you. Yeah, so last week, how many of you remember what was spoken last week or anything about last week? Spoke about Abraham. A lot, of, lot, of, lot of things was happening in Abraham's life, right? So, huh? The three promises, yes, yes, the great one dependency that was all hinged on that one uh, dependency of all three promises, yes. So, so yeah, huh? True Abraham. True Abraham, yes. Very nice. Yeah. So we saw that um, imperfect side of Abraham, right? How he uh, went back to Egypt, how he fell into sin in Egypt, how he uh, uh, disowned his own wife. So, yeah. So today we're going to be looking at another side of Abraham about his relationships with God and Lot. So see a lot of emphasis on Lot traveling with Abraham, going wherever Abraham goes. So what is happening? What is this uh, dynamic structure of relationship between Abraham and Lot? The underlying question for today is, what were we put in the world to do? Why are we here? We could have just, God could, God could have just created us in heaven and everything would have been perfect. What is the, what, why is earth there? Why are we here? Why do you have to listen to me? Yeah, let's, let's look at Genesis chapter 13 for today. Before that, I'll just give you a small uh, history on, not history, uh, just, a, just on who Lot is. Lot is Abraham's nephew. Abraham's brother's son is Lot, Haran. Haran is Abraham's brother. He's deceased. He is no more in this point of time. So he was evidently the only member of Abraham's extended family who went out with Abraham to Canaan. We see that in uh, chapter 12, verse 4 to 5. So Lot's story, Lot's life is very much woven within Abraham's history. But it's not a very happy one. It's much of a sadder one. So it begins here in chapters 13 to 14 and ends by chapter 18 and 19 of Genesis. So where does Abraham go and what does he do when he returns from Egypt? So last week we saw that Abraham went to Egypt, right? Because of the famine in Canaan, Abraham is going to Egypt. So we saw that he failed to exercise faith in the Lord when a famine came upon the land. We saw this in chapter 12, verse 10. He left for Egypt and there he allowed his wife to be taken into Pharaoh's, uh, Pharaoh's uh, house. So in an attempt to save him, his own self, despite this faithless act of Abraham, God did not abandon him. Do you think God abandoned him? We see the promises coming to Abraham after his act of faithlessness. So today morning, we heard a lot of uh, 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 prophetic words on faith. So because we have faith, we have faith. So what is this uh, opposite thing that is happening here? Because of Abraham's faithlessness, is God giving him all of these promises? So we all know that Abraham was sent back with his wife and everything he had. So an enormous disaster was averted from the eyes of the Pharaoh. This we see in verse uh, 20 of chapter 12. So verse 3 tells us that Abraham very deliberately of verse 3 of chapter 13 or coming into chapter 13 Abraham is out of Egypt now. Pharaoh is sending uh, Abraham out of Egypt. Verse 3 tells us that Abraham very deliberately retraced his steps as he returned to Canaan. How do I know this? It's written in the Bible only. First he returned to Negev. How did he go to Egypt? He went from Negev to Egypt. Now he's just retracing his steps. So from Egypt, he's coming back to Negev where he had made his near disastrous decision to go to Egypt in the first place. We know this from chapter 12, verse nine. Then he 
went from the Negev to Bethel along the same path. The verse written in the Bible is from place to place. He had traveled from Bethel to Negev. So now he's coming back. He's retracing his steps. I'll tell you why this is important. So he's tracing his steps back from Egypt to Negev to Bethel. Finally, he came back to the place where he had first worshipped God formally. And which was that place? Chapter 12, verse 8. Now again, he is back at that same place in chapter 13, verse 4. Now he again called on the name of the Lord. So what is going on here? What is the, uh, what is the premise of this retracing of steps? This is somewhat reminiscent of the way Jesus called Peter to confess his love three times. We all know that Peter denied Jesus three times, right? But do you all know that Peter confessed his love for Jesus also three times? This is from John chapter 21, verse 15 to 18. So he denied Jesus three times. He retraced his steps back to Jesus. He is confessing his love to Jesus three times. Same thing. Abraham is, in essential terms, Abraham is repenting. This is the heart attitude of Abraham in this particular chapter. He, he acknowledges that he was faithless. He's retracing his steps back, which is in essential terms, repentance. He's not simply trying to uh, repress the painful memories of his failures. He's not trying to, okay, let me put this behind me. No, he's not just uh, opening the dustbin and just throwing it. No, what is he doing here? He's facing his sins fully and directly. He is dealing with them in repentance. And then verse 4 of chapter 13. And then he renews his commitment to God in worship. It says in verse 4, he called on the name of the Lord. Again, he called on the name of the Lord. So we see Abraham in Egypt, his faithless act. And he, it could have gone two ways. After he acknowledged his faithlessness, he could have said, okay, I'm, I'm not faithful enough for God. Let me be in one corner in Egypt. I'll just live my life out. God won't accept me. So in that particular instance, he looked at his sin of faithlessness. He just chucked it down the drain. Okay. I'm faithless. Gone. I don't want to look back at this again, ever again. And in one corner. But no, Abraham did not do that. He retraced his exact steps of what led him to Egypt in the first place. It says the place where he first thought of going to Egypt is where he is going back again. So he's facing his sins. So this behavior is very uh, telling that it, if failure drives you away from God, or you can't bear to face your failures fully, it is because you have, you don't have a full understanding of the gospel. Abraham's behavior shows that Abraham was coming to a deeper understanding of the gospel. Yes, he was faithless, but he's facing it. He's facing his faithlessness. He's facing his sins. And he is coming back to God and he calls on the name of the Lord. How? In chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, we see he had been called by God out of idolatry to put his faith in God. So we see in the beginning of the 12th chapter itself, God calling Abraham to put, Abraham, put your faith in me. And then he just does the exact opposite of that. If you read more of chapter 12, first part of chapter 2, Abraham put your faith in me. And he does the exact opposite. This is like just telling, like a mirror in front of me and telling me. And I just read, uh, I was just reading my Bible verses and I'm like, oh, I'm not doing this. I'm just doing the exact opposite of what it's saying. I don't know how many of us have felt like that, but that, that definitely struck me. When Abraham failed so badly, he failed so badly, but God intervened. 
how did god intervene here did god intervene in abraham yes god did intervene in abraham's life through pharaoh god showed pharaoh that you know this is not his uh, sister it's his wife only so don't so give it back to him that is how god intervened he brought him yes thank god for that but yeah he brought him out of egypt do you think he deserved to be brought out of egypt no come on god just tells him come on have put your faith in me and he does the exact opposite and if i was god hi, i'm telling okay i'm telling blessed come on blessed do this put this chair over here and he takes a chair puts it outside go god i don't want this i don't want this chair i don't want you only anymore you're useless only now that is how i would have reacted but no god is like oh you put the chair outside okay come i'll help you bring the chair let me let us do it together god is like he didn't deserve it man this showed that the basis of his relationship with god what not was not abraham's own worth was not abraham's any merit he didn't get he didn't score 100 marks in faith he didn't score he didn't even pass he didn't even score one mark one mark but still but somehow god is sovereign his free grace the free grace of god is reaching abraham and he's being brought out of egypt this revelation always has two effects first it humbles you to realize that it's a two effects the revelation of the free grace of god is the revelation what is this what are the effects it humbles you to realize that you may be chosen abraham was chosen what is the let's look at the dictionary meaning of the word chosen when will you choose something when you have many options right a multiple choice question so i choose this option so out of but the thing is god didn't take the dictionary word of chosen it humbles us to realize that we may be a choice sorry we are chosen but we are not a choice for god he chooses us that's it we are chosen now now there's no choice okay now uh, chosen uh, blessed okay he's uh, he's not being faithful now i'll release him from the chosen uh, anecdote now i'll go for the next choice no we are not a choice we are chosen that's it that is the that is that is the effect of revelation of the free grace of god what is the second one it assures you that god loves you and is going to be there for you no matter what that comforts this comforts us enough to be repentant it humbles us enough to be repentant we need to have hope of god's mercy and acceptance if we are going to even dare to be honest with ourselves about the extent of our sin what do i mean by the extent of our sin so i am a sinner but if i don't face my sins completely and if i put on a moral a uh, mask for my own self then i'm not facing my sins completely i'm not accepting god's free grace for myself so this is like uh, oh yeah um, okay this is a sin okay let me just tone it down no that this is not that much uh, it's not that bad i don't think i would have done that bad but no we are all sinners i am the uh, sinful the, the most highest sinner and if i tone that down then that is me not accepting god's mercy not accepting god's grace abraham didn't tone down his sin he traced his steps exactly and he went face to face with god if i think that my worth my self worth and my lovability are bound up by my moral performance by how i perform or how i am outside then i will never be able to admit to myself or anyone else of how much of a failure i am if and only if you know both of these facts you will be able to respond to failures with a humble and joyous confidence of gospel repentance so that is when we will truly understand repentance only then we will be able to look back at our past sins 
fully in the face and deal with them. There was this uh, small screenshot that Karan shared with me this morning. Very relevant. So it says, uh, the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible if you don't face it. Abraham faced it. He sinned. But after that particular point, he did not go away from God. He did not keep away from the presence of God. He came back. He retraced his steps. That is exactly how we need to deal with our sins. Full on, face to face. Now, look, now let's bring in Lot. So now we saw Abraham's uh, priorities. Abraham is coming back to God. He's retracing his steps. Now he's in this particular place. Now let's look at Lot. Abraham faced a test of faithfulness. He failed the test, but still God showed his full grace because Abraham repented in gospel repentance. Now, another test for Abraham from chapter 13 verses 5 to 9. This is not a test of adversity, but rather a test of prosperity. What was Abraham and Lot's problems in this particular point? Money. Yes. They're fighting. Abraham's uh, herdsmen and Lot's herdsmen. Actually, you know, uh, let me just tell you why they have so many herdsmen. In the place that Abraham and Lot were, they became very rich. They have accumulated so much of wealth so much of cattle that Abraham had to hire a lot of herdsmen to take care of the cattle and Lot is hiring a lot of herdsmen to take care of the cattle. Now they've accumulated so much cattle and so many herdsmen that now they're clashing. Okay. Abraham's uh, sheep are feeding in the same grass. Lot's sheep are also feeding in the same grass. They're fighting. Oh, Abraham, I'm Abraham's family. I'm greater. I need to get the best grass for my sheep. And he's saying, oh, I'm from Lot's family. I need to get the greater grass. So this fighting is happening. Why? What is the root cause? Because they have multiplied in prosperity. So prosperity and success can be as great a trial and a problem for our faith, just like difficulty and failure. So the narrator of uh, Genesis also mentions uh, other groups living at the time in verse seven, we see it's not just Abraham's uh, entire herdsmen and uh, family or just lot. It was, there are other people also, which made it even harder to find enough room for the flock to get grass. So it was obvious that Abraham and Lot could not continue living next to each other. They would have to go to different parts of the country. So if they were both going to thrive, thrive. so if they want both, both of them, if they want to flourish, then they have to move away from each other. Otherwise, they'll keep fighting and this will keep happening because there's no not enough room for the herds and the flocks. It did not take much wisdom to see that. So if you're, there's no space, okay, then a little move away. So that is common sense. But Abraham responds to this particular situation in a very remarkable way. How does he respond? He allows Lot to make the first choice. Even, even in today's world, that is not possible. Even in, the, in modern generation, where we talk so much about equality with everybody and everything, today there's a, there's a this is not possible. He's allowing Lot to make the cho first choice. Who's Lot? Lot is Abraham's brother's child. So then, who gets precedence first? The uncle gets the precedence. Only then the younger fellow, the nephew, will get to choose, right? Just remember, just remind, remember this. This is like in Abraham's time, and Abraham is doing that. Oh, come on, Lot. Uh, there's a lot of troubles. Abraham could have easily done this, right? Uh, I'll take this better part of the country. You take this part of the country. And Lot couldn't have questioned anything. He didn't have any right there to question Abraham, right? Okay, my uncle is saying I have to obey. So that would have been the situation. But no, he allows him to go to the, he allows Lot to go to the best part of the land. The elder is defending the younger and lets him make the first choice. How did he arrive? Uh, 
how did how did uh, he arrive at this approach how did abraham take this approach abraham sorted out his priorities his core values that we talk about today every person is having some core values oh i will never skip a red signal ever that is someone's core value even if it is 3 o'clock in the night if something is red i'll stand there for 10 minutes only that is my core value just like that abraham had a set of core values we have seen in verses 1 to 4 abraham now is recommitted to following god's call to stay in the land and to trust god to fulfill his promises but there's a second priority he mentions in this same chapter chapter 13 let's look at verse 8 what is abraham saying in verse 8 what is the key word here we are brothers abraham singles out one non negotiable priority the maintenance of a strong relationship within the family he was a strong positive he wants a strong positive relationship between a lot and himself abraham is emphasizing on that fact we are brothers which means that that is one of his core values but abraham is also holding on to god which is his main core value so then what are abraham's options here right now what can he do he could have stayed with lot and moved out of canaan altogether okay yes family is important we are brothers we shouldn't uh, go separate ways we'll just move to a bigger space uh, there's some lot of space outside of canaan that i see near jordan we'll go there that could have been the first choice that might have enabled them to find a place where they could grow well- wealthy together that would have maintained his relationship with lot but not with god what is the second option that is what is the second option that he could have done he could have chosen the fertile part of canaan for himself instead of going away from canaan into jordan he could have seen okay uh, let's look at canaan okay that is the fertile part i'll take that part you take the second best part that could have been the second response what would that have done that would have maintained his relationship with god by staying in canaan but not with lot lot would have resented him oh come on look at this guy he took the best part now now i don't have uh, good food for my cattle only now my sheep is not getting fat i'm not getting good mutton all because of this abraham only he would have resented abraham for life but what is the third option abraham could offer to stay in the more difficult more arid part of canaan while lot took the more fertile land what would this have done in terms of relationship this would maintain his relationship both with lot and with god and what would this have done to abraham's economic future his uh, wealth decline yes there's no not enough cattle feed for the cattle so he has to reduce his cattle farm he has to if he reduces his cattle farm there's no there's no trade there's no money flowing so i would have thought so much about this i would have, oh, how, how do i feed all of this monthly seventh what bill i have to bill okay electricity bill gas bill okay now i okay now okay, i don't think i can uh, move there i don't think i can uh, go to the difficult part of uh, india uh, there's no comfortable toilets there so Abraham could have just said that no he didn't think about anything he think he didn't think about his economic future any that i would have thought so much about moving anywhere oh what is the price of milk packet in that particular can i afford the milk packet 27 rupees oh in pune it is only 26 rupees i am not going there last week only they changed to 27 now <laughs> it didn't matter to abraham he's not thinking about Uh, his economic future and living what kind of a businessman is he he said in verse 9 we see abraham saying this you choose where you want to go 
and I will take what is left over. I have a younger sister with whom I fight a lot. I take what I want and leftover she'll have. The leftover you can. You want ice cream? I'll, I'll take the first lick, then you can. We all want priority in this world. In this queue, oh, I came first. You go back of the queue. We all want priority. We all want to be first. We all want to be better. But Abraham here is doing the exact opposite. He chose to put God and family ahead of career and wealth. Let that slide just sink in. It's like, ooh. We move, I, mo I moved away from family in search of career and wealth. I moved away from the church just so that I can get a better job. Oh, there uh, I'm getting a better salary in that particular area, in that particular state, in that country, I'll do better. I'm not looking at the church. I'm not looking at any family, no relationship. Career and wealth, yes. Ha. Oh, stock market is doing so well. Okay, I can work from anywhere. I'll move to Bali only now. Abraham chose to put God and family ahead of career and wealth. What is our priority? Where do we stand? Where do we stand in this spectrum? God and family and career and wealth. Don't say in the middle. There's no middle. You're either here, you're either there. What is our priority? Now let's look at Lot's response to this. So we see Abraham, his, uh, him tracing back his steps, him doing everything, him giving up his uh, ancestral right to take the best choice of land. He's giving that up to Lot. We see Abraham's priorities set out right. Now let's look at Lot. What does Lot's choice tell us about his heart and his character? What does Lot do in response to this very gracious offer? Of Abraham. Abraham is saying, oh, Lot, come on, you choose first. I'll take whatever is left over. Abraham is very gracious like that. What Lot is doing? It's easy to read past verse 10 without noticing it. Let's, let's uh, look at verse 10. I'm looking at two particular statements from verse 10. It is said that Lot looked toward the fertile Jordan plain and saw that it was like the garden of the Lord and like the land of Egypt. Let's look at these two phrases. These two phrases show us something of his heart, of how his heart was operating, of how Lot's heart is operating. The garden of the Lord and like the garden of, and like the land of Egypt. So when he says like the land of Egypt, what was Egypt like at that time? He's saying, oh, this is like the land of Egypt. So Egypt was... A sophisticated civilization, a luxurious place, a place of wealth, where a place, a place where you can thrive, which developed its civilization into a narrow watered plain along the Nile. So you see Nile flowing down. So Egypt is on both left and right sides of the Nile. So it's very, uh, how do you say, uh, flourishing and thriving in terms of wealth and uh, trade and commerce. He was dreaming of getting his own living standard up to the living standards of Egypt. And then he says, like the garden of the Lord. This might simply be a hyperbolic uh, language to say that it looked like paradise. But it may also indicate the kind of spiritual idolatry that the heart sometimes is capable of. Not sometimes, the uh, heart is very capable of. Sin leads us to treat good things like career, family or money as ultimate things, things that will fulfill our deepest longings. All, all human beings, we live away from Eden, alienated from God, and therefore 
always restless and unhappy even in the best conditions very so we always say oh if i uh, here lot is saying oh i want that piece of land because it looks like egypt it looks like paradise i want to improve my living conditions so i'll go there was he happy there we all know what happened to lot he fulfilled his innermost desire of taking the best choice of land we have our innermost desires which is our ultimate goal oh uh, i'll go to uh, uh, uk i'll buy one uh, 774 bhk a villa and i'll buy uh, yeah, i mean the queen's house is 75 bhk i know something like that ha uh-huh. i'll just take the what is that some palace only right i'll take that and then then i'll be ha uh-huh. then i'll be settled ultimate goal over yes settled done career wealth everything is solved but we will still be unhappy because we the only place where we will truly be happy is is in the garden of the lord which is ultimate eternity in heaven nothing in earth can give us ultimate happiness so the only way back to the garden is through god's salvation but instinctively instinctively we are humans we try to get back on our own way on our own efforts on our own merit oh i'll do this i'll uh, do that i'll take five gold medals here five silver medals here then i'll yeah i'll go through we say uh, if i can become a successful artist i will finally experience happiness and fulfillment if i become a successful uh, 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 what is a uh, investment banker uh, i'll be uh, the uh, I'll, uh, i'll experience full happiness if i become the best data scientist in the world ha ah, yes that is the ultimate pinnacle of success for me but nothing is like the garden of the lord except the garden of the lord verse 12 seems to indicate that when lot moved to the southern plain of jordan he the southern plain of jordan if you look at the map of canaan he actually moved out of canaan lot actually moved out of canaan if that is the case lot's priorities are revealed to be the opposite of abraham's he was quite willing to leave the land of promise in order to grow wealth the result will be disastrous as it is hinted in verse 13 and we will see also in verse 19 about uh, sodom and gomorrah and how the lord brings him out of that as well but yeah he's he's quite willing to leave the land of promise he's quite willing to leave his family is quite willing to leave the lord's promise in search of wealth in search of a better life in search of better living standard what are the practical implications for us what are our priorities we see priorities of abraham on one side on and what happened to him and on how he is retracing his steps how god is dealing with him and the other side we see lot on his priorities as well many practical implications for us notice here that lot moved from the country region to the cities in today's context and the result was terrible does that mean moving to the city is terrible oh i moved to pune oh my god it's a terrible idea let me go back to my village only let me go back to my hometown no that's not the case does that mean everybody should stay away from cities why was lot told to stay away from uh, sodom and gomorrah what was happening in sodom very happy everybody was very godly people uh, praising god uh? wicked people wickedness it was filled with wickedness so then pune also is very godly people we are all pray- very uh, godly city here uh? no pune is also filled with wickedness no nobody wants to comment it's not a press conference so <laughs> nothing is recorded i am recorded okay <laughs> so yeah so what is the difference then here we we are censuring lot for going to a city we are saying oh that is a bad decision that lot has done 
but yet we are in a city we are in a place of wickedness the city per se is not the source of human wickedness and there are examples where god calls believers to go to cities if you see jonah he was called to go to a city jeremiah chapter 29 we see going tell him going to a city however what we learn here is that we must have the right motives for moving to cities or the temptations of the city can harm us the temptations of sodom harmed lot he went into the city and it wasn't like he was untouched by the city he was he were gave in he was a true citizen of sodom what are we are we a true citizen of pune or are we a citizen of christ are we representing christ here this is what we need to think about I'd like to end with this we learn that there are right motives for moving to cities lots selfish ambition put his own wealth and status putting his own wealth and status ahead of god and family which is why he was defenseless against the seductions from the city of sodom or wherever he went are we defenseless do we have a defense are we holding on to our defenses are we putting up a fortress holding your defenses and putting up a fortress are two different things putting up a fortress means okay i'll be in this city i'll be in my house only i won't go out i won't talk to anybody I, otherwise i'll be untouched otherwise i'll be touched by the wickedness of the city oh no we are here we need our defenses but in the same way we need more people to join us we need people to come to us that is the true message of the gospel that is the reason i believe that we are in cities what was jonah's reason to go to the city to warn the people and what was the result of that the entire city came to god wow that is that is the ideal situation because of me kevin entire city of pune came to god wow what a what a sensational news very nice right that should be the case but here we are like oh god oh. so monday to friday i have work i can't do any saturday oh. back is spinning uh, very old now 30 years almost can get out of the house on saturdays sunday oh sunday also full busy only church uh, lunch and all is there monday again back to work oh god oh. give me some holidays i don't i don't think we i don't think i am practicing uh, i i think i'm putting up a fortress by giving reasons practical implication for us from abraham he obeyed god he obeyed god through his faith he retraced his steps back to god even when he sinned and he put god and family ahead of career and wealth let's close in prayer lord jesus thank you for this wonderful time lord father thank you for speaking to us through your son abraham through the word through the book of genesis lord father thank you for revealing to us the true heart of abraham lord father we pray that we pray that we we can replicate the same heart lord for you, for you for our father lord jesus i am a sinner we are all sinners just like abraham lord father i pray that we are able to trace our steps back to you face our sins come back to you lord jesus lord father i pray that you receive us you your abundant grace lord jesus is the is the whole reason that we are yours that you have chosen us and that we are not a choice for you lord jesus we are chosen jesus thank you for choosing each and every one of us in this room present here lord father we pray for each and every one of us that we will remember all of this that we will remember to put you ahead of anything else lord jesus if you are able to maintain relationships around us lord father lord jesus we pray that all of this is leading up to you all of this is ending with you 
on the cross for our salvation lord jesus thank you jesus thank you for that and because of that we have eternal life we have eternity to look forward to we have the garden to look forward to only the garden of the lord is the garden of the lord lord jesus our merits do not count against anything that you have up there lord jesus our father let us work towards that let us move forward with that lord jesus we pray for each and every one of us present in the city lord jesus we pray for this city make this yours let us be salt and light wherever we are let us be beacons of your word lord jesus father help us to maintain the defenses lord jesus help us to not be consumed by wickedness wherever we are rather let us be people who are beacons to bring people into you lord jesus come at all of this into your hands in jesus name we pray amen